My name is Dan Whelan, Senior Reporter for Place Northwest, and it is my pleasure to be here today to chair this roundtable. Is a lack of education on certain planning matters one of the biggest blockers to development in this country? A study by CT Group suggests this could be the case. A misunderstanding of what Greenbelt actually is and a lack of knowledge about newer forms of development, such as data centres, leave the layperson ill-informed. This manifests sometimes as nimbyism, causing headaches for local authorities and private developers. Today, I'm joined by experts from across the industry to discuss CT Group's research, explore how the public's perception of the planning system is impacting development, and ask what could be done to change things. Uh, for me, I found a lesson in, in how bad we have been doing public consultation. Uh, I think clearly been not pursuing the right channels of getting to uh, the public that would uh, hopefully be supportive of our schemes. Uh, I would say, if anything, uh, we're, we're off pace in the types of approaches we've made. I think the key takeaway for me is actually flipping that question about lack of education around and are we as an industry expecting too much of general public? A lot of um, planning policy in, is very nuanced. The, the questions just raised um, earlier. So the expectations that we have on the public, I think we really, really need to understand how informed they could be and what questions we need to be answer, asking them to get the most out of consultation engagement. I was thinking about the ability for people to engage, not just as part of a planning application, a part of that process, but also in plan making. And I think that's often forgotten in terms of a real opportunity for people to make a meaningful change um, in the places that they live. And it's the same, not just not just talking about trying to raise engagement to particular planning applications, but say, you know, local plans, community regeneration frameworks, etc. So you're always going to get um, more people opposed to the scheme when you make the decision at that level, because the people that are in that locale where the decision is being made are the one is are the ones where the the harms are most concentrated mm. and, and most obvious to get that support on a wider basis you need to look wider and you need to look in a more diffuse way when you ask people who are generally in favor of development would they go to something like that they said no they're far too busy raising families doing other things they don't generally attend traditional consultation exercises that most developers do the way you have to reach them is through facebook through youtube and different means to draw their attention to your scheme and get their support. You have to make life easier for them because they're not going to go out of their way to go down and go in a small hole somewhere and look at that and other developments. So to reach supporters, you have to use new technology and you have to use their language and the things they use to get their information. It's just talking to people and explaining exactly what it is. Nobody likes change. You know, it, that's that's documented fact, isn't it? Everybody assumes the worst. But if you take the time to speak to people, and some people's minds, you will you will never change. When you have someone who objects to a planning application, it's normally very personal. It's how it affects them. Um, they might see the benefits of uh, employment, but if it means lorries trundling past their front window then they're going to oppose it even though they can see the benefits of employment the population as a whole don't identify any political party as a party of house builders currently however there is the support for it so there is the option here for political uh, po you know, parties to to take uh, a leap into the somewhat unknown which is to be pro house building pro development but they have to be careful and they need to show how it will closely align with the aspirations of the voter as well. It's not just about creating houses, it's about how does it help that community. But it seems to be human nature that if someone supports or might want to support something, they don't bother. If they're against it, they'll always bother. It's how do you engage with those people who might support you? And I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure I've got the answer to that, but how do you physically drive people out to either to sign a petition to say they support something? And I think that's something that as a, an industry, we need to look harder at.
I've worked at CT Group for over four years now and we've dealt with a multitude of different schemes. I've yet to be able to roll up a scheme where we have not delivered significant support for a scheme. We've done a lot of different viability schemes. There are always supporters out there. It's just a matter of finding them, engaging with them, and it is by different means than the traditional means to motivate them to support. We've generated support in thousands in certain schemes, thousands of letters of support. We've had people motivated to attend the hearings and speak in favour of it by speaking to them directly. There are supporters there. I think too many developers focus on the Lindys. They focus on that group who are going to change their minds. The renters are so much more likely to support development. I think that that is a demographic that in the planning system, whilst it is there's, there's very logical reasons that I can imagine that group is, is so um, prominent in, in terms of supporting, uh, I think that is a demographic that the planning system doesn't often address as a, as a specific group. You've got a huge body of, or group of people, coming back to my first point about renters, who they want to be buying, it's not affordable. And that is a hu huge swathe of people that should be supporting these developments, but it's not on their doorstep. And therefore they're not engaged in that process. How to join that is extremely difficult because why Why would a city centre renter, they might they might support it in principle, but why would they spend any time in sort of directly uh, voicing their support for a scheme? I think we should start with acknowledging that grief belt is a necessary evil. I think that's the job of government to explain what the green belt does and where it affects people. It, it's regional. Um, we've got green belt throughout the metropolitan areas, and it it's been there to keep that coalescence at bay. So light up the airways and tell people. I think. The interesting thing about Greenbelt is that it's often used as a bit of a political football, I think, in terms of change overall and, you know, potential that someone's looking out of their window and their nice green field suddenly going to be built on, even if it's not within the Greenbelt. So I think it goes back to that kind of understanding point and kind of overall kind of general education. I think it's absolutely essential that we have a rebranding. It's just, it's now become over the last well, 70 years now, it's just become green, therefore it's a green field and it applies to all green land. So it needs to be be rather something like settlement buffer and protection zone because that's what it is. I think it's important to remember where Greenbelt policy came from. It was also established at a time when the government's population projections were that the population would grow relatively slowly. And you know, we we very quickly exceeded the level of level of population growth that the government expected. So we're now in a situation where whilst the policy in principle might do a reasonable job policy in specific and in detail um, you know is probably about is doing a bad job and it, it, it's choking off economic growth in lots of places. If we had that more sustainable approach looking at around train stations around the, where there are more accessible places where they have the services available rather than skipping on to the areas outside of the green belt that would make a much more sensible approach and that is much easier to sell but quite often the problem is is that Greenbelt is bigger than local, so it's very hard to sell in one individual local plan. Well, I think it's fundamental to explain that it, it is a, a land use designation, not a, a protective landscape designation. Um, but you see politicians who don't get that, and they'll go on breakfast TV and talk about it. So I think it starts with um, local councillors, politicians. You see um, a, a lot of um, campaigning against green belt, particularly in the northwest, and local plans that are going through at the moment, and a lot of councillors that seem to be very involved in it, but unwilling to explain to their constituents, you know, but actually this is what's happening, and this is what the green belt is, and this is the purpose of it. I think we've suffered in the planning sector for quite some time in terms of the lack of education and the lack of resource within the planning system itself. And that's something that the government needs to address and it's been long in the digestion and it's something that we really do need to get to grips with. I think rebranding is absolutely right and re-educating actually what the ring belt was about. Because planning is about balance. We always talk about planning balance. At the, at the moment, those groups that heavily politicised the green belt have won the day. We need to readdress that.